for hitting it. Oh, Randy beat me to it. <laughs> Your post-it note, that's right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking with us and joining us at, you know, our, at the symposium. And I'm, I'm excited to be introducing <laughs> Susan Crichton at, for this session. Uh, and then there'll be, there'll be a session that we're gonna go right into after this. And, and um, Aaron and Maureen from the ministry will, will continue the dialogue. So Susan Crichton is a professor at UBCO and she'll be walking us through uh, some of the work that's been happening this spring um regarding regarding well yeah the research that that can you learn has been kind of supporting and i'll i think i'll just hand it over to susan at this point i will be putting in the chat um a word a link to a word document that susan wanted to be shared with everybody so um that link is going there now and yeah without further ado over to you susan well, thank you very much, and um, how delightful to be with you all. Um, I um, Actually, Thomas, if you want to do the screen share and just share that doc as well, because I'm not going to move off of it, um, I want to welcome everybody um, to this study. And I think um, I feel very honored uh, to share this work because um, both the process was pretty exciting for me, um, but the findings were astounding. And I think they speak well of the educators in BC who so richly collaborated um, to the design principles we're gonna share today. And so what I've given you in the handout is a link to the Canny Learn uh, Research Projects site. And then the second link, on that is the actual study. And I wanna acknowledge uh, my dear friend and colleague, um, Ellen Kinzel's really rich and important work um, in this study as well. And so I would encourage you all um, to download the link because I think it provides a very rich and important um, background to what I'm gonna to share today. Um, Randy and others can much better explain why we did the study, but I will explain what the study was and the approach we took. And so if you're following along, and we'll just leave that document and the principles up there on the screen, uh, screen there are eight principles that we came up with. And I think the, better, the best question is, well, there's actually a couple questions. Question number one is, do these principles resonate for you, to you, um, as underpinnings for what constitutes quality e-learning um, in a pan-Canada sort of way. And then secondly, what do design principles do for us and how are they different from frameworks, guidelines, tick boxes, checklists? And so one of the things that's in the document that I gave you the link to is a little background of what design principles are and, and kind of what they are not. And what design principles are, are truly the accumulated wisdom of the people who are asked to inform them. And so while I'm standing beside this and Ellen is standing beside these eight principles, they're not our words, they are the distillation of a lot of input from quite a few educators who took the time to participate in what we call design conversations. And those conversations started with um, surveys, then they became Zoom-led conversations, and then they became a set of principles that we circulated back to all the participants in the studies, uh, in the surveys to get their feedback, to make sure we weren't putting words in the mouth of educators or um, trying to direct uh, the principles, the design of the principles. And so um, if you happen to have the larger document in front of you, on page four is just a little reminder of what the design thinking process is and how that design thinking process generated the principles that you see in front of you today. Um, page five of the document, the larger document, and I'm not gonna go into detail on it, is all the steps we did to ensure that the design thinking process honored 
the voice of the participants and that generated these principles in a generative and um, inclusive manner. Later on in the study, um, we offer from page six and onward, all the participants who contributed to this. And we do believe we had a very good representative sample of educators in British Columbia, um, both by age stage of the participants, but also their locations and where they work. And the last thing I want to say about um, um, about the, the study itself is way, way down um, in that larger document. Um, you'll find something called table four. It's on page 15 of the document. And what's exciting about that, I think, table four, is the principle with an elaborated definition or a clarification of what the principle means, and then some actual evidence that um, is from the surveys and from the conversations that support each of the principles. Um, and so I offer and I focus this on table four of that document just because I think sometimes when you're looking at, thank you for sharing that, sometimes when you're looking at um, a set of principles, they seem um, too general, or they seem like, where did those come from? And I just want to assure all of you um, that the principles that you see in front of you, the eight principles that we're going to go back and talk about now, these principles came legitimately from the participants' voice. They represent contemporary and existing good literature, and they're backed by evidence from the surveys, from the conversations. And I'll pause here for a second before we actually drill into um, before we drill into the principles themselves, because I'd like to take a minute and talk about each of the principles, particularly before we hand over to Aaron. And I want to leave time for myself to explain what on earth anybody would do with a set of principles as well. But I'll pause here and ask, um, first off, Ellen, if there's anything you wanted to say about how we went about this work. And secondly, whether anybody in the audience um, wants to ask anything just about what design principles are and, and how we went about getting them. Uh, well, thanks, Susan. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to speak, but uh, yeah, it was a very interesting process that uh, people, um, a general invite went out to asking people if they were ex giving a brief explanation of uh, what was going to be studied and how and the process and asking them to just sign up uh, that they were interested in participating and we had such a great response <laughs> that we ended up sending then a, a questionnaire asking uh, a number of questions that uh, led into the uh, comments that became part of that uh, table four. And then <clears throat> we um, followed up with uh, inviting a representative sample out of that group to participate in live on uh, in Zoom conversations led by Susan to discuss uh, the comments and, and what uh, had been developed as a draft set of principles. And, um, and finally, we uh, circulated the draft principles and asked for final feedback on what the participants thought were the priorities. And uh, so that's uh, kind of a little bit about the process. And I'm really happy to see a lot of familiar names in the participant list in the session today, people who actually contributed and participated in the study. And maybe they'd like to say a few words about their experience. Or not. <laughs> Ellen, thank you for that. and. Um, I'm not going to cut off those conversations. Maybe, you know, if you did appreciate, I mean, if you did participate, not appreciate, good heavens. Um, but I was just reading the, the comment in chat. Maybe just throw that in chat. And what I'm going to do is direct us back and um, 
Thomas, if you'd put those eight principles back up, I'd, I'd like to take um, a few minutes to talk about each of the principles and then offer um, recommendation at the ends of that um, about how I would hope ministry and educators and leaders might, um, might use the principles to inform the work. So principle one is quite interesting. And I, and I wanna also say, I need to take a pause here. Um, they are principle one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but they are not in any rank order. And we asked the participants, could you rank them? And I think it's the only thing that participants really disliked about anything we asked them to do because it was too hard. And, and so um, these principles are not in a ranked order and particularly I would embrace them more as a set of principles to be attended to rather than an order of principles that need to be addressed. And so having said that, the first principle we're gonna talk about is the need to act, uh, the access, the need for access to models of good learning and teaching with exemplars and a hub of curated resources, materials, and materials to support those models. And the main thing I wanna draw your attention to is it's plural. It is not, it is not a model, nor an exemplar, nor a handful of resources. It is plural and needing multiplicity, multiple examples of this at various grade levels, context, settings, um, one size does not fit all. And so I think this is a hugely um, important fact. One of the things that really anchored um, our belief that principle one is important is when the participants were asked where they get resources and materials right now, 73% of them said they get them from colleagues, which really creates a rather randomness um, to access rather than an intentional access to initial exemplars that would set up an understanding of what good models might be. And so I'll just pause here, principle one, before I go on to principle two. Um, please feel free, um, I've got my eye on the chat, throw in any comments there or hands up and ask any question. Principle two, um, I was gonna say I particularly like principle two, but um, Ellen will laugh because I say that that on all of the principles because I actually like them all. But principle one and two are really connected. Um, principle two, as COVID showed us, context change. Education works when it's flexible, responsive and open to change. Educators need timely supports, including PD, wellness, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to respond. Probably the most important part in my mind to principle two is that last statement, supports must reflect educators' career cycles and context. I find this astounding in that, um, I don't know if Elizabeth Childs has joined us, but in 2004, she and I wrote an article <laughs> that said, what do educators need to move online? And it was reflecting the fact that often professional development is a one, one shot, everybody gets the same information. And what we're learning um, from the research and what we've known from the research is depending where you are in your career cycle, depending where you are in your understanding, your training, your education, your background, you need professional development that's nimble and reflects who you are and what you need. Whereas a prescriptive model or a keynote speaker often just doesn't do the job or the next good idea. Principle three, I think is totally delightful as well. Um, educators and families need to develop a deep understanding of the importance of engagement and how to foster it. And this, generated a huge amount of conversation. One, do we deeply understand what engagement is? And so in table four, um, we've included a link to a wonderful study that was done, a Pan Canada study 
called What Did You Do at School Today? And in that study, what they did was they figured they broke engagement out into um, various parts that there's academic engagement, the engagement with the content, but there's social engagement, your ability to work with the content. And then there's intellectual engagement, which is that ability to use that, that information and be able to reuse it and repurpose it and deeply own it. And I think sometimes we're quite good at getting the academic engagement or that's where we work, but we tend to forget that there are other forms of engagement um, that are just hugely, hugely important. And each of those forms of engagement requires a different kind of pedagogical approach and a different way of unearthing it and supporting it and fostering it. And I think one of the things that was hugely valuable um, in this, in the, um, one of the things that was hugely important um, in the conversations, design conversations, was the fact that particularly with online learning and particularly during the pandemic where people were at home, the families have to be intricately involved in this. This isn't something just the educators can do and help. The kids have to be involved and the context, the families where they're sitting, the kitchen table kind of takes over that need of needing to understand how you foster engagement. Uh, principle four, uh, ways to enhance relationships. This was just a wonderful conversation as well that relationships are just not with the content, but they are academic, they're intellectual, they include creative and social activities. And so if we want to have relationships with our students in online, then we have to remember that art and outdoors and, and all the social aspects are hugely, hugely important. And often it's these relationships that get lost and that might have gotten lost in our rush to move on um, online during COVID. And so one of the things that came up in the conversation was also the notion of um, what are the various relationships that impact learning, both family, school, the students among themselves, and recognize that the relationships that were lost are one thing, but as some people pointed out, different kinds of relationships were expanded and created because of Zoom and getting to have other kinds of ways of, react, of um, engaging with folks. And I'm so thrilled to see chat coming alive here. So, and Elizabeth, thanks for posting the, the full study um, on the engagement. It's really, really quite worth reading. Principle five, I think is delightful because truly it wasn't the most important. It was not principle number one. Um, principle five about technology as an enabler is hugely important. Technology is not the driver of the bus. It is the enabler of the learning. And this came forward in conversations. It came forward in the survey responses. And it's hugely important. Technologies inform good manners, um, good, good models of teaching and learning. They do not dictate them and they don't but they can constrain them. And so principle four has a lot of information in it, particularly in table four of the final of the full study. Um, and then there's a whole list of talking about uh, the desire to understand technologies as they relate to things around how you foster relationships, how you support engagements. And a lot of discussion around and a support around seeing how technologies can be enablers of those exemplars, those resources, and those materials and models. Um, principle six, I have to say, touches very close to my heart. And once I left uh, the K-12 system and moved to the University of Calgary initially, it was very clear to me how difficult it is for us as a system to move the intentional and professional preparation 
of educators for online into the structures we have. It is quite rare to see the intentional preparation of educators for online learning in parts of teacher education programs. And my guess is it's probably Pan Canada, similar to what it is in British Columbia. Understanding online teaching is not part of our um, BCTC uh, teacher requirements. Uh, so it's silent on that regard. And I think the thing that was interesting is, you know, 61% of the respondents in the study we did had absolutely no formal training um, to teach online. They got it, they are well-trained, they felt confident and capable, and this is not any uh, negative statement about the state of the, the respondents' understanding of how to teach online. It's just a comment that this is not an intentional thing that's coming from regulatory bodies or teacher education or those kinds of things. Sorry, Chris, Susan, well, just, gonna, just a hmm. reminder, we got about six minutes to the top of the hour. Okay, uh, uh, I'll move quickly. Principle seven, um, a call for research that's timely. I think this was heartening as well in that the educators uh, who spoke to us were really, um, they really cared um, deeply that they knew that what they were doing and how they were working with children um, was research informed, not random, not arbitrary. How do they know that what they're doing is quote, right? And so this was a call for research that's very strategic. But secondly, it's not research that's done for the post-secondary and then we just assume it works for the K to 12 but really research aimed at the K to 12 to inform the K to 12. And then for those of you who joined us a little earlier, we were talking about ergonomics and wellness. And principle eight really was that online learning, blended learning, working from home, ensuring that you have a healthy, good workstation, that you aren't just glued to the screen hour upon hour, that there's breaks for wellness, there's attention to ergonomics, um, and then, you know, and then there's the mental health issue. All those things are needing to be addressed and informed and, and attended to when we move online, because there is a possibility, there is a possibility that because we're online, it might be more difficult to detect or understand or become aware of. And so that's my friends. Uh, it's just my honor and privilege to present the really good, rich thinking um, of the educators who responded to our survey, to be able to distill their words into eight, I think, very cogent, clear principles. And so the concluding thing I want to say today, which, you know, of course I could always say more, but I'll make this my concluding comment is what the heck do you do with principles? And I say from the research and the study I do with design thinking and design is principles have to be reviewed and renewed. So organizations like Canny Learn and others, you need to take this set of principles and they are not the 10 commandments. They don't sit there cast in stone. They get reviewed and revisited every year to see whether they're still relevant, whether they need to be tweaked, tweaked or honed. But what they are is they're a living entity that you can use almost as a filter, if you will, to inform practice. So what are we doing? Is it, does it align with any of the principles? To inform frameworks, to inform guidelines, to inform things like quality assurance and other kinds of things. And so the principles sit here as something that as you're about to make a decision on something, will I teach this way? Will this approach work? Should I buy this technology? We pass those decisions through the eye of the needle of those design principles. And what I would argue is say that before we make a decision, we wanna make 
a principled decision. We're not making just a decision. We're making a decision that's informed by research, by the users, by what we know to be good practice. And therefore, those eight principles tell us, is that a good decision to make? And the last thing I want to say about design thinking as a process, what's so respectful, I think, and helpful about using a design thinking approach versus all the other research methodologies we might have used, is design thinking assumes that the people impacted by the decisions actually how hold part of the answer to the decision. And I just want to, again, and I know Ellen will join me in this, is thank the educators who gave so much time and gave so much thought to all the answers that fed into this study, because truly they do honestly hold the answer um, to what we need to do to ensure that quality e-learning is available quality online learning is available for all of our students. And it won't take a checklist and it won't take a set of guidelines to get there. It will take a principled approach that's research and practice informed to ensure that we're doing the best possible job we can for the learners that we work with. And so I'll stop there. I'm totally keen to answer any questions or continue the conversation. But I just uh, want to also thank Can eLearn um, for giving us the opportunity and trusting us to sort of do what probably up front seemed like a bit of a wacky process to go about uh, methodology. But um, I'm pretty, pretty excited by what we came up with. We're going to blame that trusting you on Elizabeth, okay? So just saying uh, as part of that. Um, and Susan, I'm going to tackle one question because I know it will probably get you going like crazy, which is uh, about is good, good career path for new teachers and are the values for online teaching shared across the system? I think, I think those are really important things that we need to continue to work on. Uh, and it's a theme that came up in our Cross Canada panel as well. Um, so questions, comments, uh, we're loose on time. We can make sure that we've finished around design principles before we transition into the ministry piece as well. I, I think I just want to uh, bring the conversation because I think it's a nice segue, Susan, just kind of how you finished just now. There was one other question that popped up and especially keeping design principles in mind. And um, Christopher had the question about, did you look into or ask the K to 12 students perspective of what quality online learning is? And I just wanted to give you the opportunity to reply to that. No, and, and I think what, what I would flip back is say, I think we've got a great methodology for either Pan Canada and a whole bunch of folks, educators. And I think the next logical thing, quite honestly, is to ask parents, ask guardians, ask the students, you know, really expand the study because um, the model that the, you know, what did you do across, uh, what did you learn across Canada study really showed us students have a very strong voice and a very strong um, understanding of what works. So I think taking this, replicating this study, if you will, in with multiple groups and Pan Canada uh, would be, I think it would work, honestly. So great question. <laughs> more, bring on more. <laughs> Elizabeth, did you want to ask that question? It just came directly to me by mistake or whatever. Um, <clears throat> there's just as well, sure. I just want to say Michael Barber's not here, but there's Speak Up, which is an annual survey in the US of students. And we don't have anything similar in Canada. That might be something we want to look to. Thanks, Randy. Susan, do you, could you, and you may have spoken about this earlier, I was a little bit late logging in, um, but did you ground this and differentiate between the principles around online learning versus the experience during the pandemic around remote learning? Did you differentiate that yet for folks? No, and I don't think we differentiated, uh, maybe elaborate that, maybe I'm missing something. I don't think we differentiated it um, in the study itself, and actually Ellen can probably contribute to that. We did ask, um, well, Ellen, you can talk about the matrix and how we uh, 
ensure the participation, um, a broader participation? Because I think that's what you're asking, Elizabeth, is we had folks that came to online because of the pandemic, and then we had folks who been online um, as part as a career choice as an option. Um, Ellen, did you want to speak to that? If if that was what Elizabeth was asking, I think. Yeah, we definitely tried to um, fill in all the boxes that that we had. Um, elementary teachers, we had middle school teachers, we had secondary teachers that um, either were coming from the classroom and forced into online teaching a year ago and how it, and their voice was really important. But we also listened to a lot of people who have been either teaching solely online or in a blended environment for quite some time. So they have the experience behind their comments, um, but they have a totally different perspective than the people who, oh my God, I got thrown into this without any preparation whatsoever. So um, in terms of reporting out the results, uh, I don't think we differentiated, Elizabeth, between uh, the people that were new to online teaching versus the people who had been in it for a while. And I, thanks, Ellen. That's really helpful. And I think, you know, I'm noticing the chat here. Yes, there's a deep history and there's a deep research um, to online versus, oh my gosh, March, you know, 2020, we're teaching online as an emergency response. And I will say the most interesting thing to me, while everyone's saying, yes, it's a big difference and it's a hundred years and yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in online and started working online in 1991, as did Ellen, because we did it together. The thing that is breathtaking to me in the work that I have seen in working both in British Columbia and Alberta is Th those principles have held true as gaps and things we need to address and we need to do better at. So I would sit here as somebody with, you know, kind of an elder in the online learning space and say, yes, we know a lot about this. Do we always express it as principles that then guide our practices? I mean, at, when I went to the University of Calgary in 2001, I thought we would entrench online learning and the preparation of online educators as part of teacher education. Couldn't see how we wouldn't as it was a burgeoning field. Elizabeth and I wrote an article in 2004, the heyday of online learning in Alberta, thought it would be entrenched in teacher education called for it. We actually had one student that I'm aware of, student teacher, um, do a practicum in an online setting. So these are the kinds of systemic organizational things that I think if we want to move the field forward and we want to attend and address those principles in a principled way, this is the time to do it. And organizations like Canny Learn and conferences like this that bring together a number of educators across Canada, this is the time to make change and to ask for change. And gee, no pressure, but we're going to turn this over to the ministry next. So what are we going to do to ensure that we are taking a principled approach to the offerings of online learning, and at times, um, the um, remote learning going forward. 